Uh, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Welcome to the latest Duke Media Briefing. I'm Greg Phillips with Duke Communications. Thanks also to everyone joining us on YouTube. You can like and subscribe to be notified of future briefings. We have three Duke experts with us today to discuss how America became so very polarized and what, if anything, can be done about it. With us today is Chris Bale, a professor of sociology, public policy, and data science at Duke University, where he directs the Polarization Lab. He is author of the new book, Breaking the Social Media Prism, How to Make Our Platforms Less Polarizing. Also with us is Alison Cheney. She is an assistant professor of marketing at Duke's Fuqua School of Business. Cheney studies the development of machine learning methods and the impact of these methods on individuals and society. And we have John Rose. He is an instructor in the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke University, where he teaches classes on topics including political polarization, conservatism and happiness, and researches the tradition of virtue ethics. Thanks to all of our panelists for joining us and good morning. John Rose, we'll start with you. Why is it so hard in this day and age for us to disagree civilly? Civil disagreement is a human activity like any other. Uh, it requires practice to do it well. But simply, we've fallen out of practice uh, in the activity of disagreeing well. Um, sociologists will tell us that we've sorted ourselves across the country into our own political groups. That means we have fewer opportunities to disagree civilly. And when we do, and I say this as somebody who comes at this question from the standpoint of an ethicist, uh, we are increasingly deficient in the intellectual virtues required to engage in productive, respectful discourse. For instance, open-mindedness, intellectual charity, intellectual humility, and the like. Sure, absolutely. And we'll certainly dig into uh, what, how we can address that and how you've been addressing that in the classroom. Um, but for right now, I'd like to move on um, to, to you, Alison Cheney, can you talk a little bit about how the way we consume news and how that has changed over time has contributed to political polarization and how that's kind of manifesting itself now? Absolutely. So you know the way that we, that we consume media before basically the age of the internet, we used to have a few shared ch channels, you know, you know, yeah. So we'd have, you know, news that we would, we would all watch the same news. We'd all, all read the same newspapers. There's, Etc. Now, so much content available online that we each have the opportunity to receive personalized, very custom content that is closely aligned with our own our own views or um, kind of our political niche. So, some examples of this is recently we had uh, masks. We've had the pandemic, pandemic masks. You'll see a wide range of articles on just that one issue alone. So, you'll have some articles about how, how it, you know, like driving drunk not to wear a mask, you know, that, that it's, you know, a risk to society. And you'll have some article, articles talking about whether or not there is a health risk of wearing a mask and how that can be, you know, a problem. And you'll see, they'll see those on a variety of, of you know, salads, um, you know, covering from positive to negative sentiment on, on a, just, just an issue, let alone on the full spectrum of issues. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Chris Bale, I would like to move on to you now. Um, at the Polarization Lab, you've used data to analyze this problem and found that stepping outside our online echo chambers can actually make us more polarized. How is that so, and how have you used data to help you reach this conclusion? Yeah, one of the things we've discovered is that a lot of the most popular ideas we have about uh, how to solve political polarization on social media, um, th there's very little evidence to support them. Um, so for one, um, the idea of stepping outside your echo chamber, um, you know, most of us, myself included, thought that taking people outside your echo chamber, exposing people to those on the other side would increase moderation. When we did a study of this in 2017 um, by paying people to follow bots that exposed them to the other side, we actually discovered that instead of becoming more moderate, people tended to become more extreme. Okay, sorry about that. Thought I was unmuted, and apparently I wasn't. Okay, uh, <laughs> so thanks very much for uh, all of our panelists for those opening questions, and we're, we're hurdling over these audio obstacles as we go here. Uh, we're going to open up to questions now. Um, uh, you can pose questions via the Q&A window at any time if you're joining us on Zoom. If you would like to ask a question in person, you can raise your hand in Zoom, and we will unmute you when your turn comes around. 
If you're calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. And thanks again to everyone who's watching this on YouTube. Um, so for right now, I'd like to press on um, with you, Professor Bale. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about the mechanism behind what seems to be driving the fact that people would get more polarized when they were uh, exposed to the other side and, and some of the things you've figured out about how we can address that? Sure. I think many of us would like social media to be the kind of idealized public sphere where, you know, we have a competition of ideas and, and the best ones kind of rise to the top. Now, clearly, as anyone who spends some time on social media sees, this is not what's happening. We're seeing increases in instability. We're seeing um, extremity and, and other kinds of, you know, really unruly behavior. Um, and so I think the important question to ask is, you know, why do we use social media? Um, you know, the common idea is, well, we go on there to get some information, maybe entertain ourselves a little bit. But in an era of increasing social isolation that has been underscored by things like the COVID pandemic, we're increasingly realizing that social media is really the primary tool we have to understand our place in society, what other people think and, and, and learn more about ourselves too. And so when we think of social media as really a tool to create our identities, it explains how extremism can result from, say, social outcasts who are really just status seeking and, and are getting something out of, you know, becoming increasingly extreme online. It also helps us explain why moderates are so invisible online. People have very little incentive to share their political views if they're only going to be attacked by the extremists who seem to dominate the platforms. Sure, absolutely. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, Alison Cheney, uh, we had a little bit of audio struggles uh, with your opening uh, remarks. And so I'd love to hear from you again, if you could just tell us um, again about uh, the use of masks and the people's response to masks as a kind of symptom of, uh, of how some of this polarization is playing out in terms of people's consumption of news right now. Absolutely. I apologize for the issues, issues we had before. Um, just, you know, going back to the mask example, um, you know, we have you know, a wide range of news outlets that cover a single issue, right? right. We have um, um, people talk about whether or not um, refusing to wear a mask is less like driving milk. Uh, um, and that's, there's a comparison made there. So it's this extreme um, opinion where, you know, you, you should wear a mask and if you don't, you're posing societal risk. And then you, you see on the other extreme, people saying, um, you know, if you, um, if you wear a mask, then like are health rep repercussions you like is, you know, are, are there are there negative aspects of, of, of wearing masks? And then also see, you know, you know, taking down of, of there was, you know, an issue of, um, you know, a, a two, two year old not wearing a mask on an airplane, things like that. Uh, and that can be framed in completely different ways and how the news articles we read shape our perspective on just a, just a single event or a single issue. And um, in what I find all of this is, is you know, what is the algorithmic role in all of that? Because um, there's a lot of um, you know, there's a lot of different aspects to how to how polarization is happening. We have sort of you know, individual choices. We have sort of, sort of social settings. Um, we have the pol political climate, and then we have the technology that we're interacting with. And all of these things you know forms com complex system. And I think, you know, each of us as experts here are, are, are kind of pulling at different, different aspects of trying to understand what's happening all from different angles. Sure, absolutely. That makes yeah. sense. Um, uh, go ahead. Nope. Oh, okay. So I think that was an echo. <laughs> I can tell if somebody was speaking or that was an echo. We are uh, riding a bumpy road this morning. Um, it's an echo chamber. Gotcha. Exactly right. <laughs> Oh, oh, the irony. Um, John Rose, I wanted to, to come back to you. You mentioned in your opening about how we've lost this uh, ability to have civil conversations. And obviously you're uh, seeing this and, and literally addressing it in the classroom. So how do you think that we get back to uh, a place in which people can disagree civilly over something that they disagree about very deeply? Yeah, well, first of all, it shouldn't happen online. Uh, we now have the data, uh, thanks to Dr. Bale. <laughs> um, um, but that confirms what I think a lot of us already suspected. Um, to disagree better, uh, we need to practice in person, in the flesh and blood. And we need to do it over a period of time. And we need to get to know these other people. We need to know their biographies, where they come from, literally, um, their family, um, activities outside of politics. Build that relationship. And then when you come to discuss politics, and if there's disagreement, as there often is, it'll be set within this greater context. I know this person, right? This is a view that I find 
wrong, maybe even immoral, uh, but it is humanized by virtue of the fact that I know the person who holds it and I know them not to be a villain. Uh, this is the key. It, it needs to happen in person. And that's hard to do. And social media uh, obviously uh, makes it impossible. Um, and so for my part, um, I'm teaching in person this semester. I'm not on Zoom. And uh, that's important. Um, in the classroom, uh, it's about allowing your students to get to know each other and building trust because there is disagreement among students as well. It's the human component that matters. Sure, absolutely. Um, Chris Bayer, I'd like to come back to you on that because, uh, you know, as we know, um, as, as Joe Rose has just explained, it is easier to find common ground in person. But as you've mentioned, social media, you know, in the, in the last 10 years has become how we find our place in the world. But what I find interesting is, is one of your arguments is that we can only expect so much out of social media platforms and revising how we approach social media also has to be an individual pursuit. And it's something we change as individuals. Can you talk a little bit about how that can happen and what difference it could make? Yeah, so I'm with John that I would love for us all to spend more time together offline. But if we're practical about this, I think we need to recognize that social media is here to stay. I mean, one only needs to look at young people um, who really grew up with social media and grew up with phones pointed at them to understand that um, you know, social media is going to be one of the main ways we communicate with each other for some time to come. So the important question to my mind is, you know, how can we incentivize better behavior on social media. We spend so much time talking about the negatives, uh, misinformation, algorithms and radicalization, echo chambers. And really these things are, are really hard to counteract. They may even be counterproductive um, to counteract these things. And I think we have the most leverage by trying to generate a bottom up movement, by trying to change user behavior. And so in my new book, Breaking the Social Media Prism, I describe several strategies that, that any social media user can, can, can kind of take on, as well as a set of new tools on polarizationlab.com that people can use. These are things like bots, quizzes, um, other kinds of apps that help people become aware of, say, trolling or identify people on the other side with whom we think they're likely to find compromise. Sure, that makes sense. Um, and John Rose, taking this back into to the classroom, and I realize this is maybe a little bit beyond the scope of what you're talking about in, in your classes, but I'm, I'm interested to get your take on it. Um, uh, apparently in Finland, you know, there's already an effort to um, go beyond just teaching um, digital media literacy, but to, to teach some of the things that um, Professor Bale is talking about with regards to the ability to spot misinformation, to understand how bots work. Um, do you think that that's uh, because, you know, here you are kind of trying to hold back a tide and understand that interactions have to happen in person so that we can, you know, understand one another better and, and break down these walls of polarization. But given that so much of this is happening online, do you think that that would be an important part of education moving forward because social media appears here to stay in some form or another, um, that we need that as a, as a component of moving back towards civil conversation? Yeah, I think those tips or techniques are great. Um, I think Inevitably, it will, though, come down to uh, decisions of individual will. Uh, that is, um, when the bot is urging us to uh, join in uh, in um, a kind of a scapegoating of another uh, person um, or becoming part of the mob, uh, that's a choice we have to make. Uh, and it's a moral choice. Um, we can either practice intellectual charity and humility or not. Uh, so that aspect, I think, is unavoidable. Um, and we need, we need to uh, also be paying attention to that. Absolutely, gotcha. Um, I do want to come back to the, to the notion of platforms too. And uh, Professor Cheney, hopefully we've been able to smooth out some of your audio issues. And I know that um, a, a great part of your work, even beyond looking at polarization, but is uh, studying the algorithms, machine learning, whether, whether pressure is brought uh, to bear on social media platforms or not. Are there things that can be done at the algorithmic level to say weed out misinformation, um, basic objective facts that are being misre misreported, um, or or are we? Uh, is it foolhardy to think that the algorithms can can solve solve the problem that they appear to have partially generated? How much can be done at that level? Do you think? All right. So first, this, oh, this is bad. There. Okay. Is that any better? Yes, absolutely. That's perfect. We have conquered the echo chamber in here, if not in society. Okay. Um, Please carry on. So. Um, and I can't hear any of you right now because <laughs> I had to um, silence my computer. But um, for you know, dealing with the 
um, the issues on the platforms, um, you know, it's, it's really difficult to automatically remove, um, you know, remove bad content. Um, a lot of that has to be done manually. And so the platforms currently kind of go through this manual fact checking pro process. And so I don't think that it's, you know, gonna be an, an easy solution by any stretch to try and remove content that's, you know, clearly false um, to us as individuals, but then, you know, find an algorithmic way. So that's, that's a, a very challenging technical problem and I don't think that's gonna get solved anytime soon. Um, but there are other sol solutions to kind of help address polarization. And, um, you know, on that front, <laughs> if it's not audio, it's video. Um, on that front, um, you know, the things we can do are intentionally include more diverse content so that people are, you know, looking at a wider variety of, you know, of, you know, news articles, for example. Um, and then, you know, so the way the platforms are engineered can intentionally try and, you know, avoid this homogenization issue, avoid this, this echo chamber issue. Um, but it is challenging. There are some, um, you know, technical potential solutions, but it's, um, you know, it, it's a big challenge and it's an open area of research. Sure, absolutely. That makes sense. Um, I'm glad you mentioned this notion of uh, falsity uh, because it's something I wanted to, to get into. Professor Bale, I'll come back to you. You know, you've talked very eloquently about how um, there are tools that we as individuals can use. Um, but I'm wondering when we, when we know right now that there's, uh, there are fundamental basic objective facts that somehow have found themselves in dispute and uh, it appears that social media platforms have uh, passively or not contributed to you know, confusion over things that are basic facts. What kind of responsibility do you think platforms do bear or what can they do at the platform level to at the very least, if not eliminate disagreement, uh, kind of a, take a, a look at things that on their platforms that are just factually wrong um, and weed that out? Are there things that can and should be done at the platform level? Yeah, I think we need to ask what incentivizes people to share fake news? Um, we need to think, we need to take the user's perspective. And if we do that, I think what we find is that, you know, right now, the way most algorithms are designed on social media platforms, they reward engagement. So they reward people who share something that gets a lot of likes or, or gets a lot of comments, right? And so it's unsurprising that divisive content gets kind of upranked in this way. Um, and that most of the people who, you know, some of the extremists we've studied in the polarization lab and that I describe in my new book um, are, are really, you know, out to get new followers by spreading misinformation. So one thing that, that I think that social media companies can do is create better incentives for civil behavior. And a nice example of this um, is Twitter's new program, Birdwatch. So Twitter has created a crowdsourced program for misinformation detection that gives people status, um, new forms of followers and their badges and things like that for rooting out misinformation and for promoting high quality, uh, high, high, very truthful information. And so I think that's a nice example of something that a social media platform can do to incentivize better behavior. Sure, that makes sense, thank you. Um, John Rose, I'd like to come back to you. We've had a question come in and I, I'm, I welcome everybody's perspective on this, um, but the question asks, because we're in this moment where there are fundamental facts, you know, that people for somehow are able to disagree on, what, what do you do? Because civil disagreement is one thing, but if you've got somebody that is unwilling to accept fundamental truths, whether they be about science or objective facts about the world that aren't in disagreement among people who understand those things, where do you start? Um, because I guess that's where some of the incivility comes from when there's exasperation over an inability to just accept fundamental truths that hadn't been in dispute in the human race for decades or, or longer. How, how do you begin a civil discussion over something um, that is just fundamental and objective uh, when you can't get through to somebody that doesn't want to accept an objective truth? Well, I think open-mindedness is a virtue up to a point. Uh, there are certain things uh, about which we won't say there are two sides or both sides. Uh, the example I give my students in class is that uh, we're not going to give anybody a seat at the table who would dispute the fundamental equality of all human kind. Um, that's a subtle fact. Um, but there are disagreements about is this or that racism? Is this or that sexism? These are the tough ones. Um, you mentioned facts. I assume you have in mind something like climate change or election results. Uh, those tend not to come up in my classes, um, but obviously it's, it's out there in the public. And here I think we can be firm. Yeah, I think um, open-mindedness requires 
us to uh, listen to the facts. Uh, and I try to put things in moral terms rather than uh, shame the other side uh, for uh, giving in uh, to uh, the dissemination of false information. Um, I ask them uh, to put truth above victory, um, to value the truth more than uh, seeing your side proven right or saving face. Um, and you can do that in a way um, that allows them to um, preserve their own sense of dignity as well um, and not feel humiliated. Uh, the phrase I use is, friend, come up higher. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Chris Bauer, I'd like to come back to you on a, a different aspect of the same question. So the, the question was about people who don't want to change, you know, people who maybe have um, beliefs that can be demonstrably incorrect about the world, but they don't want to change. You've talked about the tools that are available on social media for individuals who, you know, who want to uh, make sure that they're not getting too polarized. But what about the millions of people on social media that maybe have no idea that they have beliefs that are demonstrably false? Uh, or don't have any interest um, in, in, in changing or opening their minds to, to other perspectives. What, what do you think can be done to reach those people? Or the, can the incentives you've already mentioned play a role in that? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is to recognize that some of those assumptions might not be true. So there's a widespread phenomenon called false polarization out there. We tend to overestimate the extremity of the other side and underestimate the extremity of our own side. We've seen this in the US over time and many different countries. And of course, social media amplifies this. Um, you know, we see social media really boosting these extreme voices and muting these moderate voices as I, as I describe in my new book. And so, um, you know, the first thing we need to do is recognize that the scale of the problem might not be as big as we think it is. So um, we've all seen some eye popping statistics about the you know, amount of misinformation that's out there. Um, but when we really go to look at its impact, um, as we were able to do in a study two years ago, where we uh, worked with Twitter and U.S. intelligence to estimate what happens when people actually interact with content from, say, the Russia linked Internet Research Agency, we were really surprised to discover um, that it didn't seem to affect people's political views and it didn't seem to affect the way that people are, are, are um, viewing the other side. And so we need to be careful not to make misinformation into a, into a self-fulfilling prophecy, into something that you know, really starts to steer us away from the bigger uh, challenge, which is to identify those issues where there really is room for compromise. Um, you know, great example right now, um, handgun control and assault weapon bans. You know, look at the numbers. Republicans are about five or six points off Democrats, um, 80, 50, 80 to 90 percent in both parties supporting a lot of these measures. And so certainly we can find areas where there are probably intractable uh, divisions, voter fraud, um, you know, other very highly charged issues right now. But depolarization is going to be uh, it's going to start by finding those issues like the ones that we track on our hashtag tracker, we have a tool on polarizationlab.com that allows people to identify the current online debates where uh, Republicans and Democrats seem to be agreeing, or our bipartisanship leaderboard, which gives people a kind of status uh, for producing content that appeals to people on both sides. There are moderates, you just have to find them, and we hope some of our tools will help uh, people do that. Sure, absolutely. And I guess it's understandable that moderates have been fairly quiet in the last year when things have been so very loud on either end. And to that end, um, uh, Alison Cheney, I'd like to come back to you. Because um, even though we had, you know, some, some bumps in the road in your earlier statements, hopefully enough of it came across that people understand that, you know, what you've looked at here is personalization in our media consumption, um, which, I mean, it, it might sound like a simple solution, but how do you think that we go about, uh, you know, if our, if our media consumption has become personalized and we're not even necessarily aware of it because it's being done for us on platforms. What are some of the things that you could, do you think can be done at a personal or a societal level to make sure that people are getting exposed to multiple perspectives um, in the media that they consume? Right. So on a personal level, there are two main things that you can do. One is that you can um, go in and look at your settings. Like a lot of these platforms like Facebook and Twitter, um, well, more Facebook um, because Twitter has less personalization, um, but on Google as well. Um, you can go and look at your pro profile. You can see the tags that you've been assigned and you can unassign tags that you think aren't relevant or that are potentially polarizing you. Um, you also, you know, can, you are in control of the people that you're following and you can go and look and see if you are following people with a variety of opinions or not. 
right? That's something where you need to be introspective. And then if you are, you know, seeking out um, news, so if you're going and logging into the New York Times or NPR or whatever it is, um, you know, that is a conscious choice that, that you, you know, has probably become habit over time, but you can choose what platforms you are looking for um, or, or looking at to find news. Um, so just considering a, a wide range of options um, and intentionally reading people that you disagree with um, is, is a really useful exercise to just like personally take those steps to try and understand uh, a wide variety of opinions. So there's the kind of technology side, but also, you know, the personal side. Um, and then as a society, um, you know, I guess there are some, some, you know, things that the platforms can do in terms of making those tools, you know, more transparent, more available, kind of Facebook can send out emails, you know, reminding people that these privacy, you know, or these personalization settings exist. Um, there's not necessarily an incentive to do so um, for a lot of these platforms because the revenue they get is often tied to personalized ads, right? And so it's it's a challenge um, to kind of, you know, where is the line? But there is some legislation out there about, um, you know, either, you know, in, in practice or, you know, potentially floating about, you know, privacy, um, privacy information and how that's connected to, you know, how your user information is represented on a platform. And the more we have access to the information that's, you know, how, how we're represented, then the easier it is for us to kind of control what we're seeing from a platform, even though there's a little bit of challenge there. So the society, one of the things we can do to impact the kind of technical side of things is make sure that um, there's sufficient legislation, um, and, I, and I'm not like pro-legislation on everything, but sufficient legislation on certain issues of, um, you know, consumer data so that we can uh, ensure that everyone has access to the information that's going into these personalized recommendations. Sure, thank you very much. Um, Professor Bayo, I'd like to come back to you on uh, something that Professor Cheney just said, is that obviously at the moment, social media platforms are incentivized to keep doing what they're doing, right? Because it's been a very profitable model for them. Um, and so do you, do you think that in addition to um, the ideas that you proposed in your book and discussed here, do you think that there are, uh, there are additional steps that need to be taken in order for um, social media users and platforms to actually get on this train? Um, uh, in addition to the, hey, this is a good idea and could reduce polarization, if they're not actually, you know, monetarily incentivized to do so right now, what would it take for, for it to become a reality? Yeah, I think we have to think about the supply side problem here too. You know, we were polarized long before social media came along. And I think, you know, probably a lot of us would agree that social media seems to be heightening polarization to some degree, or at least in some, some ways. Um, but we were a very polarized nation before um, Facebook, before Twitter, uh, before Instagram. And I suspect that even if um, some of the actions that, you know, social media companies are often lobbied to, to take, like, you know, doing a better job countering misinformation, um, perhaps making some of the algorithmic changes um, that are on the table here to, to, the, to the way we order information in our news feeds or recommend new friends, or, you know, um, just more broadly, um, you know, this, this issue of the echo chamber, I think um, we wouldn't see a sea change in behavior right away. Um, you know, the, you know, there, in other words, I think there is a role for the platforms, um, but this is why I'm so passionate that we need to de be more introspective and, and recognize that we all have a role in producing this outcome. Each time we log on, just like Dr. Cheney said, we make a choice uh, about what to engage with. We make a choice about how to engage. And I think people need to ask themselves when they log on to social media, why am I doing this? Why am I sharing this? Um, you know, do I really want everyone to see my, my strong feelings about this issue? And, and even more important is the people who aren't participating. So a recent study indicates that about 74% of um, tweets about politics are made by about 7% of users with disproportionately extreme views. So what that means is we need more moderates to engage, um, moderates who have you know, nuanced positions about the issues of our days, you know, like uh, um, market-based solutions to climate change or um, effective ways to reduce gun violence. Um, we need to hear more moderates. Sure, thank you. I guess perhaps part of the problem is that, that what 
get shared is what people are passionate about. And people tend to be more passionate about the things they're more extreme about. And uh, moderates who are just sitting there chilling are less likely to be motivated to post about those positions. So there's a message for moderates. Um, yes. Jim Rose, I wanted to, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah. But I was going to say also, you know, we need to think about the reasons why moderates don't engage. The most common reason to be harassed online is for your political views. So in my book, you know, I tell the story of uh, a young Republican mother who was on Twitter late one night and started, um, you know, engaging with some posts from the National Rifle Association. And she just shared a little post that said, you know, like my husband owns a gun. He's a responsible gun owner. He likes to go to a gun range and, and practice. And, you know, I support the NRA. You know, pretty, pretty moderate position in the scheme of gun, gun rights debates. And then she tells us within minutes, um, people had discovered that she had children by looking at her Twitter feed and were saying that they hoped that her children found her gun and shot her. And this is the type of experience that is all too common on social media. Um, you know, we're not going there for the better, you know, competition of ideas. Um, it's become a competition of our identities. And in that competition of identities, moderates have everything to lose. And right now they have very little to gain. Sure, thank you. And actually, that, that brings up an interesting aspect to this. And John Rose, I'll come back and ask you about this before I come back to the question I had. Um, so much of uh, polarization, however real it is, um, seems to be fueled by, as Professor Bay was talking about, this, this trolling behavior, sudden, you know, hurling of insults at people and saying things that people would never say in person. And so here you are in a classroom and you're facilitating civil discussions, which we know are easier to have when you're face to face. Do you get the sense, um, and I'm interested in all panelists' take on this, um, that there's something about obviously the anonymity of social media. We know that that um, uh, it seems to make people in power to act in ways they wouldn't um, normally. Has this created a new aspect to polarization? We know that the country and the world has been polarized, polarized ever since there were more than one human being. Um, but is there a, a danger that the, the anonymity that social media has um, created has produced a new aspect of polarization that we've not seen before and that if unchecked could take us into waters that, that we've never been before? How dangerous is that? anonymity when it's prompted people to just say the most awful things. Yeah, it brings out the worst part of ourselves um, because we're not uh, responsible to the other person in a face-to-face -face way, right? Uh, there are things we say online that we wouldn't dare say in person because we blush, uh, we feel horrible. Um, I think okay, I want to come back to this uh, point that uh, Dr. Bell was um, making about our, how we exaggerate how radical the other side is. Um, I think it's sometimes called the perception gap. Um, and uh, for my part, I find it equally troubling that um, we seem to uh, want to do this. Um, sometimes this is called the, the, the culture of contempt. And uh, it's now said that in the news, um, it's, it's no longer the case that if it bleeds, it leads, but if it outrages, it leads. So we're addicted to outrage. What does that say about us, that we want to make a caricature? of the other side. So there's something going on in our hearts that isn't healthy. Um, and what's fascinating to me is that uh, these caricatures um, seem not to hold as much when they're people we know. Uh, and this is anecdotal, uh, but uh, I teach a couple classes and um, in total about 120 students this semester. And I did this poll twice in person uh, because I didn't believe the results the first time. Uh, and it went like this. I, I asked my students, this is the first couple days of class, uh, raise your hand if you know somebody who voted for uh, Donald Trump in 2020. And about uh, 50 of 56 hands went up in both classes. And then I said, uh, keep your hands raised if you believe this person who may be an uncle, a friend, a grandpa, whatever. It, raise, keep your hands raised if you believe this person to be uh, motivated by anything unsavory, uh, xenophobia, racism, sexism, and the like, and every hand went down but two, <laughs> which by my math is, you know, about 4%. Uh, and that's probably uh, the percentage of bad people in any group in America. I don't know. Sociologists can tell you. Um, and I could tell the students were surprised that all the other hands went down. They thought it was just their uncle or their friend who was a decent guy, uh, but somehow voted for Trump. Uh, and then I told them, I said, well, if that's true of your uncle or, or your cousin, um, why, why assume that the other 74 million are any different? After all, they're somebody's uncle or brother. Uh, this, to me, revealed that the perception gap um, applies when it's somebody else out there you don't know. 
an anonymous person, perhaps a person online. It's less likely to be the case if you know them. And I think this is telling. Sure, thank you. And I appreciate you returning uh, to the topic of that gap because that was actually what I was going to ask you about. Um, we've had uh, another question here. Um, uh, first of all, for you, you mentioned earlier um, uh, that gap as a, an example of how the problems may not be as big as we think. Um, and the question was whether there are any other examples you can give that kind of illustrate this, that we may have magnified some of these uh, polarization problems in our mind beyond where they actually sit. Yeah, sure. There's a variety of examples. So, uh, you know, just off the top of my head, um, Republicans have much more favorable attitudes towards immigrants as a group than many Democrats would realize. Democrats, Democrats have much more favorable attitudes towards the police and rural people than, than most Republicans realize. Um, you know, another really interesting study um, looked at misperceptions, and it turns out that, you know, the, um, you know, the average Republican thinks that most Democrats are young, minority, and live in cities. The average um, Democrat thinks that most Republicans make over $200,000, are evangelical Christians, and live in rural areas. And, you know, the, the irony of this, this kind of assessment um, that most people make is that the average American, the average Democrat, and the average Republican is, is white, middle class, and lives in a rural or, or, or suburban area. So there's just profound gaps. And that same study shows that when we correct those gaps, when we tell people, actually, you're wrong, you know, um, most Republicans don't make over $200,000, we see appreciable gains in um, intergroup attitudes. Um, so, you know, there is hope, even though, you know, according to a, a recent study I published in Science Magazine with, with about 20 other kind of leading experts, social psychologists and, and political scientists that showed that out-group hate, as, as John was alluding to, is now displacing in-group love. Um, it, it's at historic highs, out-group hate. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, there are all these areas where we're really not so divided and we're, we're always going to focus on, on the extreme cases, you know, a personality like Trump, um, the, the election, right? Um, but there are areas, maybe right now it's infrastructure and, and we'll start to see, see more examples unfold. I don't wanna paint too rosy a picture. America is still deeply divided about a variety of issues, um, but there, there is room for overlap and, um, and, and that's where we need to turn our attention. Sure, thank you. Um, and John Rose, I'd like to come back to you for some follow up on that. As Professor Bale just mentioned outgroup hate is at historic highs, which is, you know, is a really unsettling thing. But I mean, as you know, as a philosopher, as an ethicist, um, dissent and disagreement has been written about in human history since the ancient Greeks. And it's easy for us to say, oh, okay, things are worse now than they've ever been. And there are certainly flashpoints in American history, you know, 1968, and then the end, you know, the beginning, middle, and end and aftermath of the Civil War. But from a philosophical, historical perspective, are there reasons to believe that things re regarding polarization and disagreement are in fact worse now than they've ever been? Or are we just in, in part of a strange cycle that the human race can never break itself out of where we uh, find flashpoints in history where people are at one another's throats? That's a tough question. I'm not sure anybody really knows the answer. Um, you know, evolutionary biologists will tell us that um, it's hardwired into us to be tribal. This in-group, out-group thing um, it is there for a reason. It helps us, helped us survive. Uh, and if that's the case, then um, maybe we might not call it political polarization, but in-group, out-group thought uh, and saying, well, that person's wrong and needs to be cast out has been with us from time memorial. Uh, and in some cases, it may not always be a bad thing. Um, it clearly, it helped us uh, continue on as a race. Um, whether or not we as a country specifically are, are in a worse place now uh, than ever before, uh, I, I, I can't say. Um, I wasn't alive in the 60s, <laughs> but to hear my father tell it, it was even worse then. <laughs> I'll just, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Well, and I appreciate you tackling a question that will probably take another 200 years of history for us to have an accurate perspective on. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Professor Cheney, I'd like to, to come back to you. you know, we've, there's been this discussion of um, uh, outgroup hate and then how, uh, as a species, we seem to have become addicted to, to outrage. And I'm wondering if you think from the machine learning algorithmic level, is there value in having that knowledge? Is there something that can be done to maybe diffuse uh, this, this, this sudden attraction to outrage that we've got and, and somehow, as I say, diffuse it, address it, um, uh, you know, not um, kind of switch it off 
I guess, deactivate it? Is, is there something that you think can be done at machine learning level to help us as a species? So from a machine learning perspective, um, usually you're uh, optimizing for something, right? And there's been um, some recent work looking in um, multi-objective optimization, where you are trying to optimize multiple things at once. You're trying to um, solve for, say, both satisfaction um, in terms of, you know, the content people are enjoying, as well as perhaps some notion of diversity in content. Um, so I think that's, you know, the multi-objective optimization is really where um, we would start to see this addressed is when you're seeing um, systems that are trying to, to weigh multiple things at once. And firms are already doing this in kind of an, an ad hoc way often where they, you know, have different metrics that they're looking at. Um, but you can explicitly include, you know, a notion of diversity in your machine learning algorithm if you really wanted to. Um, the challenge is that there are, uh, you know, like you still have to define some sort of metric, right? Um, and there are lots of different metrics on diversity. And um, there are, you know, sometimes they are not compatible with each other. So if you're optimizing for one diversity metric, then you are inherently minimizing another one. Um, and so you have to think carefully about, you know, what is it that you're truly trying to optimize and how are you constructing that into, you know, something measurable? Because one of the big challenges with trying to have a technological solution to anything is you need to be able to measure it. Um, and, you know, you think about what we're able to measure with social media. It's, you know, clicks, likes, read time, duration on a website. Those things are very coarse and they're not going to capture um, a lot of the nuance that goes into the things. Um, you know, at best, you can kind of include the text or video content. But again, that's, you know, a, you're going to have a really coarse representation of what's going on. And so I think, you know, the real solutions lie at, at the personal level. Um, you know, we as a society need to you know, figure out how um, we can personally um, and combat polarization, combat um, outgroup um, hate. Um, these are the things that, that um, you know, the solution is internal and that, you know, technology can only help us so far because the problem is fundamentally social um, and that there can be, you know, assists, right? We can kind of get help. Um, but at the end of the day, you're the one clicking on news articles. You're the one, you know, watching the news. Um, so you need to be cognizant, you know, you in a broad sense. You need to be cognizant of the choices you're making. Um, I like some of the stuff that um, Dr. Rose and Dr. Bale were saying before about, you know, moderates being afraid to, to speak up or, or, or things along the, those lines. Um, I think, you know, as a staunch moderate myself, I find myself falling into this trap where I don't post on social media because I've been, you know, I wouldn't say attacked, but like the, the negative reaction to or, or non-reaction to uh, you know, moderate posts is kind of depressing in some in some instances. And so, what I found that you know, my role as a moderate um, end up being this is just you know, anecdote, not not based in any research. But my role is to support other moderates. You know, when they go get out there and they express their opinions, I I try and be as supportive and encouraging as possible. If if somebody's putting themselves out there, you know, I want to do my job to make sure that they had a good experience. Uh, and, and because there's so much negativity out there. So, you know, if we can be positive voices where we're encouraging others and, and seeking ways to kind of bring positivity to the interactions, I feel like that can go a long way. Sure, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Um, we will be wrapping this up fairly soon, but I wanted to remind everyone that you can uh, pose any last questions in the Q&A window or press star nine if you to raise your hand in Zoom if you'd like to uh, unmute. Well, you can raise your hand in Zoom or if you are joining by audio, you can hit star nine to raise your hand uh, so that we can unmute you and ask a question. Um, but before we wrap up, we do have a, a, a couple of questions and um, Professor Bale, I'll come back to you first, but I'd like to get everybody's take on this. But this question is, um, what actually changes people's minds? You know, are engagements outside of social media in person more likely to change minds? But I mean, what, what tend to be the factors that actually get through to people um, and, and change their minds on an issue? Have you looked at that? Yeah, it's a great question. It is exceptionally difficult to change someone's mind um, if you are trying to show them, say, a message. So a, a common narrative out there is that the type of political micro-targeting by firms like Cambridge Analytica, which say helped get Trump elected or, or uh, helped you know, shape the Brexit referendum, are really powerful because they've kind of hacked our innermost thoughts and desires, right? It's a very seductive narrative. 
Um, but the actual studies of micro-targeting indicate that it has very little, if any, effect, even outside politics. And so, you know, there's probably no simple digital solution, you know, um, you know, beating someone over the head with the same message is definitely, you know, not going to change their mind um, on its own. Um, giving people autonomy, a sense that they are the, the ones who are, you know, who get to judge, you know, what they think, right? We, we don't like being told what to do. Um, and so conversation does that naturally, like we can, you know, some of the offline conversations that, uh, that um, John was mentioning, um, you know, certainly there's some evidence, uh, one study by a political scientist at the University of Pennsylvania showed um, that a simple 15 minute in person conversation between a Republican and a Democrat can increase their ratings of each other on a zero to 100 scale by about 10 points. That's a lot. That's almost the size of the entire growth of outgroup hate in the last few decades. So certainly offline, um, there are some solutions. Online, I think the key things are, you know, um, we're not gonna kind of inject opinion into the masses, um, but we can kind of determine the menu of what they see. Some of the stuff that, that Dr. Cheney was talking about, um, you know, we can we can build a better menu um, and and let them make the choices. Let them persuade themselves. That seems to be the most um, powerful way of, of changing minds. Sure, thank you, uh, John Rowe. Similar question to you. You specialize in these in-person conversations. What aspects of in-person conversations can be especially effective in changing people's minds? Do you think? Yeah, as, as Dr. Bale said, it, more information won't necessarily do it. Um, I think you need to. Um, lead by example. Um, so when you encounter somebody of a different view and you can tell uh, that they are playing fair and that they're being charitable in the conversation, you're more, much more likely to listen to their views. Uh, and they may pull you a little bit and, uh, or you may pull them. You have to open yourself up to both possibilities. Um, Dr. Cheney is talking about uh, it being hard to be a moderate. Uh, it certainly is. Um, and so when moderates come forward and say, I'm a moderate, uh, it makes it easier for other moderates. That's example. Um, about 70% of my students tell me in an anonymous uh, survey uh, that they self-censor among their friends and not just the wider public um, on the issues you would imagine. Uh, almost all of my conservative students do it because I asked them for their uh, political leanings in the survey. And about half my liberal students do it now. Um, on, on issues like Israel, uh, but also on race, uh, not because they're uh, not progressive, but they, the, the goalposts are changing and they're always afraid they're going to get it wrong and get canceled. They're terrified of cancel culture. Uh, I don't know how we depolarize as a country when uh, our students in the university are self-censoring uh, to that degree, and then they go out into the workplace and it's more of the same. Uh, if we're not having real conversations, we're never going to depolarize. Sure, thank you. And Professor Cheney, same question to you based on your experience of research. What, what do you think can actually change minds at any level? It is so challenging. I think um, very little in practice uh, can you know, make a huge impact. I think, you know, as Dr. Rose and, and Dr. Bale were saying, like there are some methods um, to kind of encourage people in the right direction, but um, you know, ultimately people change their own minds at the end, at the end of the day. Um, from a technological perspective, um, you know, the things we can do to help are, again, providing a wide variety of content. Um, you can start to identify, you know, what content is um, basically, you know, if I am, you know, if I'm recommending content to a Republican, um, what is the content that um, usually falls in, you know, the Democrats like that would be kind of the closest possible to the, that particular Republican's preference. So you can try and find like, what is, you know, what, what are those step stones to kind of broaden people's minds? Because I think showing the, the far extreme um, as, as um, Dr. Bell has shown does not help. If anything, it makes it worse. Um, so, you know, we, we can, we can look at technological solutions to figure out what that menu is, um, what the, what the variety of content is. Um, but at the end of the day, people are making their own choices. So all we can do is help and encourage. Um, and then, um, as I said before, you know, ultimately it's personal choice. Um, and, and we have to just, you know, be the best people we can be and, and act as kind individuals and encourage people to, um, you know, 
make their own personal best choices. Sure, absolutely. That makes sense. I guess ultimately we are all frogs in saucepans and it's all about controlling the temperature of the water. Um, we're getting ready to wrap up here. I have one final question that I'd like to ask all three of you. Uh, and one of the threads that I've noticed through all the comments is despite the platforms, despite the algorithms, this is all uh, happens at a personal level and an individual level and choices we make. So what I'd like to ask each of you um, to address from your own perspectives is um, for all of us, we're all contributing to the problem in some way, whether we're aware of it or not. So I'd like to ask you, what's one thing that you would like somebody that, that, to, to take from this discussion or to, from this issue if you think, hey, well, I'm not part of the problem. What's, what's one takeaway that somebody should have in terms of helping them understand how they are and how they can do better? What, what's one thing you would hope people could bear in mind? And um, uh, Chris Bayer, we'll start with you, if I may. Sure. I called my book Breaking the Social Media Prism. So I'd like people to break the social media prism. And what that means is learn how to see that social media amplifies extremists and mute moderates. We all need to learn how to become more reflective social media users. And it's not just about simple awareness, becoming aware of these processes, but making them habits. And that's where I'm optimistic that technology can help. Um, so the apps, bots, quizzes, and other tools we have on polarizationlab.com and that are also described in my new book are designed to make these things habitual. Find those people on the other side with whom you can at least agree to disagree, if not fully agree. Um, follow bots that expose you to these people. Check out our bipartisanship leaderboard, which ranks these people so you can choose your own um, people to follow. But the take home message is that we, the people, we, the citizens of social media need to be part of the solution. Sure, absolutely, thank you. Uh, Professor Cheney, similar question for you. What would you hope people would take away? You know, in thinking about your question, I was gonna suggest almost the exact same thing as Dr. Bale. Um, you know, follow a wide variety of individuals on, on social media. Um, is, is one of the, the key things, as well as just be introspective. I know that's, that's sort of a not concrete takeaway, um, but I think a concrete, a way to make that concrete is anytime you're going to post on social media um, or comment on social media, take a minute, pause just one minute and ask yourself, you know, is this the person I want to be as I'm, you know, engaging with this? Um, you know, am I going to regret this choice or would I do this to somebody's face in person. And I think by doing those two things, um, the, the social media ecosystem will be a lot healthier and happier. Absolutely, thank you. And, and John Rose, if I tell you I'm not part of the problem, it's everybody else. What would you want, uh, what would you want to sink into my brain? You are part of the problem. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. in his essay, The Power of Nonviolence makes this very clear. Uh, the, the line between good and evil uh, runs through every individual human heart. Uh, social needs and said the same thing. Uh, what we see here as a societal problem is a collection of failures on the part of individuals. Um, and so while extremism has kind of been a dirty word uh, in this last hour, I, I'm, I'm a bit of an extremist on this. Um, I think the only way forward uh, is, is through love. Um, uh, I think we need to learn to love our political enemies. And that's a very hard thing to do. Um, King asked us to do that. I asked my students to do it, and many of them say it's impossible. I can't. Maybe respect, but not love. I think we have to do it. It's the only way. Absolutely. Uh, and I can't think of a, a brighter note uh, on than that to leave this on. So we'll call it there. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to our panelists, Chris Bale, Alison Cheney, and John Rose for sharing your perspectives. Next week, we'll be returning to the topic of COVID-19 to discuss whether the number of willing vaccine recipients will be enough to end the pandemic and what can be done to convince more people to get vaccinated. If you'd like to be notified about that and other upcoming briefings, please email dukenews at duke.edu, or if you're watching on YouTube, just like and subscribe. In the meantime, uh, please do wear a mask, stay distanced, get vaccinated when your turn comes. And if you're on social media and thinking about politics, maybe just post a picture of a puppy instead.